This is an interview with Mr. Roland J. Nobel. Noble. Noble. Excuse me, sir. Roland J. Noble. April 1st, 2004. Mr. Noble was born 2-23-23. Interviewer is Robert Gardner. Mr. Noble, can you tell me, were you drafted or did you enlist in the military? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? Staten Island, New York. Why did you join? Because I was forced to. It is a story. I was a senior in uh, high school and uh, the Dean of Students was a major in the First World War who was quite an autocrat. I got in a little trouble because I was working as a volunteer in the supply room at Curtis High School and uh, I got to be the uh, student sort of director. And with that, I had to recruit other folks to man the station during the day. Uh, I had about 30 folks that worked with me, all students. I also had the authority to let them out of class because it looked as if they were going to work in the supply room. One afternoon, 17 out of a class of 30 were missing. I had been a little bit aberrant and signed a lot of passes that day. Colonel, or rather, Major Morris, who used to wear his mufti, no, his, his uh, uniform on Thursdays with his white riding crop, he was a crop, he was a cavalry officer, uh, called me into the office and said, Noble, this it will not do. You are a disgrace to the school, and this was in uh, January or February of 1941. I was getting ready to, to graduate, and he said, uh, if you do not join an armed service, you will not graduate. I'll, and with this crappy, crappy, and uh, so I joined the U.S. Navy on the 9th of February, which was two weeks before graduation. The sequel to that, oh, he told me that I was a disgrace and would never make anything of myself. In 1948, he was still there as the Dean of Students. I had that by that time done some service, gone to school, and gotten Phi Beta Kappa. And I was in the New York area on a ship, and I made an appointment to go back to Curtis. I visited him. I asked for permission to visit him. Uh, his secretary said, yes, uh, Major Morris will see you. I was in uniform. I walked in. I came to salute it through my Phi Beta Kappa key on the desk let him look at it, picked it up, saluted again, turned around and left. That is the last I saw of Major Miles. Now, to go back. So this gets me into the Navy. There I am. Why did you pick that branch of the service to join? Because the Navy looked good to me. Good reason. Do you recall your first days in service? Well, uh, it was on a of uh, actually a very small uh, ship that took folks from New York up to Newport, Rhode Island. What did it feel like? Going up to Newport? Well, that was for boot camp, as they called it, and uh, I was young. I was, at that time, uh, just a little bit under 18. 
You mentioned boot camp. Can you tell me about any of your boot camp or training experiences? That, that's, I've kind of put that out of my mind. I, uh, I mean, I did not have any troubles, and uh, uh, at the end of the boot camp, I was assigned to the commissioning crew of the USS Washington, it, which was uh, commissioned on May 15, 1941, in Philadelphia, Navy Yard. Which war or wars did you serve in? I was in World War II, I was in the Korean War, I was in the Vietnamese War. Where exactly did you go? Well, in the big war. Uh, I was commissioned on the Washington on the 15th of May. I, uh, I did what they call shakedown cruisers in the Guantanamo area and in uh, on the East Coast, and uh, we were in Norfolk on the 7th of December. Uh, sometime after that, right after the uh, January in January, uh, we headed up the coast and across the Atlantic to Scapa Flow which is in northern England, Scotland. Uh, we were there to protect the merchant ships which were moving from uh, Great Britain to Bermansk. This was at the time when things were pretty tough over there. And we had 15-inch guns on the Washington. The uh, uh, several, the Schoenhoist and a number of German ships were in the Norvik, northern uh, Norwegian area. They had 13-inch guns, and we were a little bit bigger and stronger than they were, and they did not contest uh, our protection along the north, uh, northern area to Murmansk. Uh, we were in Scapa Flow for about three or four months. Uh, also Iceland, we picked them up from all over the place. And uh, one of the kind of exciting things was uh, we were in Scapa Flow when uh, Winston Churchill uh, was getting ready to go to Newfoundland uh, to talk with President Roosevelt. And uh, he came aboard the Washington. I uh, wanted to see what the food was like and things like that. And he also, and he was going on the George V, which was a British uh, battleship, to Newfoundland. And uh, he invited us to go back and uh, visit the George V. I was a, at that time, a very young, uh, fledgling yeoman. Yeoman were the penmanship folks for the Navy. And I was in the gunnery uh, department as their yeoman, a senior, junior yeoman, and so I was one with the troops. And uh, one of the things we did was inspect the G. George Wash, or rather, the uh, George V. And uh, my job was to climb up on the catapults at the rear of the George V and look at the uh, two aircraft they had sitting there. Uh, so I climbed along the catapult and up onto the wing of the, these were of course catapult uh, uh, type uh, observation aircraft. And I looked in the uh, cockpit. And in the cockpit was a nest with six little baby seabirds. I didn't report this. Tenny, it's my secret. Now you know about it. The world now knows about it. But they did not use those aircraft very often, obviously. Uh, we did the Scapa Flow thing, came back to the United States in uh, May of 19, no, May or June, maybe July of 1942, to the Brooklyn Navy Yard to have the first 
gun-directed radar in the U.S. Navy. Uh, we were the only capital ship with this, and that was quite good for us later on. Uh, of course, it was very nice for me because I was sitting in a uh, broken Navy yard, and Staten Island was a subway away and a, and a ferry away, so I got to see my family for a couple of, for about uh, three or four weeks while I were putting this radar in. Then we headed out to, uh, uh, let's say, areas unknown, but we knew where it was going to be. It was going to be the South Pacific, and we were there. We went through the Panama Canal. I've got the only diaries I ever did, two of them, which covers the period from leaving Gravesend Bay to getting to Espirito Santos, just south of um, uh, Guadalcanal. Two, and it stopped very abruptly on a Sunday, but I have those, uh, they're you know, quite personal. It's not a lot of war in it, but uh, it was an interesting operation. We got to, uh, went to Tonga Tabu, to Espirito Santos, and we were quite involved in the uh, war activities around Guadalcanal from uh, August of 1942 to November of 1942, which was about the end of the line of it. We, uh, we did have some very, okay, well that's where we are. Do I just go ahead or? Yes, sir. Okay, well, uh, we, uh, supported the uh, post-invasion operation on Guadalcanal, which was quite a hairy and uh, at the time was, you know, flip-flop as to who was going to do it. Uh, there was quite a bit of uh, strong naval armament, Japanese and American, in the area. Uh, during that time, a couple of uh, U.S. ships were sunk uh, right after August the 7th, and uh, we wound up supporting a, a major conflict on in November. I think it was 11th and 12th, or 14th and 15th, but it was in that area, and we were uh, we were the flagship. Uh, a group of two battleships, uh, a cruiser or two, and a number of destroyers, and off and back was the Enterprise and someone else. They did not get into the actual fray. On the uh, night of November the, I think it was the 14th, at midnight, almost to the T, uh, we were in was known convoy. We had four destroyers in front of us, and uh, the North Carolina and the Washington were in in the tray. Uh, we were the flagship. Admiral Augustus Lee was our uh, flagship commander. He was aboard, and uh, at midnight there was a great deal of furor, and uh, ships on Savo Island, which was across from what they called, uh, uh, oh gosh, what the heck was it? It's where all the ships were sunk anyway. Uh, there were two uh, Japanese uh, battleships, and they opened fire on our destroyers, sank two of them, which led to a lot of fire and a lot of bloodshed, of course, and the decision was made, where were we going to go? Uh, Admiral Lee made the decision to move his ship, that's the Washington, uh, to the west of the burning ships, between that and Guadalcanal. The Carolina went to the other side and took quite a bit of a beating from 
the two kind of concealed battleships. We had this radar. We picked them up. We got them both. We sank both of them. And I was a gunnery yeoman at the time. I was the speaker, they called it. And uh, the, uh, my uh, gunnery officer at, uh, at that time, I think he was Commander Walsh, gave the order to fire. And we sank both of those battleships inside of about three minutes. It was a one hell of a winter. And it was because of these radar. It was the only radar in the U.S. Navy at the time. And uh, so with that, now this was 26 miles away. And uh, it's, to this date, I believe, we are the only battleship or major ship that sank a other major combatant without seeing. We never saw him. All we had was the radar. And um, so that moved out. Uh, we uh, had our little group. And then we, the radar picked up a, a mass of a fleet of uh, Japanese ships. These were troop ships. They were hopefully going to bring in the major support to reinforce the Japanese on Guadalcanal was like a shooting gallery. We sat there and just popped them off. Not only ourselves, but the others. Also, the Carolina had got taken a couple of heavy hits. I think it was the Carolina. Yeah, I'm sure it was the Carolina. And, but they also fired too, and we all got, I think there were a total of 24 ships that were these troop ships that were sunk. And as a result, the reinforcements never arrived, and as a result, the uh, Battle of Guadalcanal just about fizzled out of that. Uh, just about five months later, uh, I was uh, told that I was going back to school in the U.S. of A. and uh, to go down to New Zealand to get a troop ship back. We happened to be on the ship that also had the 1st Marine Division, which is the one that was, you know, under great fire, and uh, which was finally, I think, uh, rotated out with U.S. Army folks. But the 1st Marine Division, I came back on to uh, San Francisco with the 1st Marine Division. So, and then we started the school there. And uh, do you want me to go on from there? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, I went to school at DePauw University in a thing called V12, which was officer candidate school for uh, fledgling. By this time, I was about two years into the into the military, uh, and uh, I spent two two semesters at. Uh, DePaul, then went down to Miami University in Ohio for another four semesters, then went to uh, Harvard Graduate School to uh, what they called uh, pre-training for the Supply Corps, which is uh, the bill collector foot group in the, they're the money folks in the Navy, and uh, I got uh, finished uh, up, not quite a master's there, cause, but at that time the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Business had been bought, bought out by the Navy to train their young officers. So that was very nice. And I got, well, uh, but anyway, as a result of that co combination of service, I got my degree. I met my wife, who, uh, was at DePaul and just about time we got married. And, uh, but uh, the last, this was right at the end of the war. And when the war finally got over, when they finally did Hiroshima, uh, of course, Harvard Graduate School wanted their school back. And uh, 
but there was a contract, so the folks, the young naval officer, potential naval officers, who decided to stay in the Navy were kept on while the rest of the troops went out, did some sea duty, and got the heck out back to their civilian jobs. So there were about 30 of us that stayed in. And uh, so for about, oh, about a quarter, about uh, three months, we had this huge university complex and all of the big uh, economic gurus who were helping um, FDR do things like uh, social security and all of these things, they would go down for a couple of days in Washington, come back, and we'd be sitting there just like this, face to face with the gurus. Uh, can't remember any of them right now, but uh, they were the biggies. And, uh, and then in uh, April of 1946, I was sent to the USS Kearsarge, which was a carrier. My first sea duty in as an officer, and I was there for about uh, three years. From there I went to intelligence school and never used any intelligence. Uh, then went to, uh, uh, this was right at the beginning of the Korean War, went to Guam, uh, which uh, during the Korean War I was on Guam, my wife got, got to uh, join me there eventually and uh, came back. Then it was a variety of, of sea duties and East Coast services. And up till 1966, I was in a variety of other uh, uh, duties and in on the 31st of August, 1966, I was retired. I was, the day I was re retired, I was due to leave for Vietnam. I had to do, my duty in the, in the military at that time was a joint service, and I was the director of a thing called the Supply Operations Center. And I procured, distributed, and tried to keep track of things like jungle boots, barbed wire, medicines for the mashes, those kinds of things. And uh, I had to sort of total control of it. It was going to Vietnam and disappearing. We we didn't know where exactly, though we really did. It was going to the Viet Cong. And uh, I had all my shots. I had my personal plane that was going to get me there the day I retired, which was rather nice. And uh, the word was out that I had about a 50-50 chance of getting home. That the supply sergeants were had a number on me as soon as I got there. One of my, my deputy in this thing of course, replaced me. He survived very nicely. He is still a dear, dear friend. He lives up in uh, uh, Tennessee. He made colonel. He was a Marine uh, Air Force type. And uh, he is the gentleman that uh, got on the helicopter inside God on the top of the legation roof, if you remember. He survived and came home. We still are dear friends. And so, and then I went to school at, uh, well, I had a P public health service grant. I had my GI Bill. I had my retirement. I was making more than the professors at Michigan when I got my PhD. And there we are. Were you awarded any medals or citations while you were no, in the service? You no, know, the usual thing. I mean, I, I of course, not you know, you're not in there shooting at eyeball to eyeball, but uh, I mean, I got European Service Medal, a uh, couple Asiatic Service Medals, 
a some kind of a DOD distinguished service thing, which I really don't can't remember what it was, at at uh, uh, in that last tour of duty. Uh, good conduct model because I was a enlisted man for a while. Those things, but nothing, nothing very exciting. What was the highest rank that you attained in the service, sir? Commander. Commander is the equivalent of a light colonel in the other services. I was uh, up for captain, uh, and I had my ship already assigned when I got out. How did you stay in touch with your family? During the war? Yes, sir. Well, for, as I said, for some of the time, I was quite lucky in being able to visit uh, my mother and my sister and things, who were right on Staten Island. Once I got, of course, into uh, uh, the far Pacific, it was by letter, and I was very scrupulous. In fact, I had a list of who I had written to in one of these things, I guess it's this one, that uh, showed who I was writing to and how, how often I'd written. I was quite, quite a, a linguist at that time. I wrote a lot of letters. And then, of course, as soon as I got home in 43, I got to visit regularly uh, from the various schools that I was at, and mostly on the East Coast or middle, middle and uh, so I'd go home on breaks and leaves and things like that. What was the food like? The food in the Navy is excellent. We did, of course, being in the far Pacific, we got a lot of mutton, a lot of New Zealand mutton. We didn't get much uh, beef, but uh, we had good food all the way through, or everywhere I went, including one tour I was not only a commissary officer and supply officer, but I had to, you know, I had to buy it and and. Uh, uh, that's kind of one tidy little incident. I was on a LST which had been converted into a aviation engineer, a, en, a, aviation engine and propeller factory. And this was right in 1954 at the time when Franco let the U.S. back into Spain for the first time. Uh, the LST was, of course, an LST, supposed to go in, drop the thing, and you do things. We had a commanding officer whose name I will not give you, and, a, and an executive officer, both aviators, who had never been on a ship before. And we were sent in to just south of, of uh, Barcelona, to support a group of P2Vs that were landed at, in that area uh, to, if they needed repairs, I was to do it. However, we did not go in and drop the, we broached, which is went in on our side, and as a result, we lost three of, three of the four anchors, that's what they had on them. And uh, we were embedded in the, right off the coast there, in a, a peach grove, actually. I mean, we could see and smell the peaches, and uh, but we couldn't get off. We were... So they brent the fleet in, and we had all kinds of folks aboard telling us how to do it and what to do it. And uh, as supply officer, I had to feed these folks. And the coup de grace was when they brought 700 Marines aboard to transfer our limited uh, uh, armament kind of supplies out of the, onto the tank deck. Uh, I had to feed them. I fed them a breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and uh, finally got it all up. The, the uh, ships uh, got free, and with that, they called the 700 Marines back, put them on their ship, and the fleet left. There we were, 
sitting off the coast of Spain with live ammunition on the tank deck. And uh, the word came out, uh, you better take care of this. Fortunately, we went into the Porto Actuarios of the little port right there. Uh, I asked him, uh, could I get some help? I said that we had these Marines that had moved the stuff. I had to get it back into the proper place. And he said, yes, they thought they could do that. And I said, well, what will it cost me? He said, uh, I don't know, a million dollars. And I said, no, I've got, uh, I got some cigarettes. And I, I went to the, my captain, this is the guy that, you know, the, the, and said, give me $300 out of the ship's fund. That gave me 300 cartons of cigarettes, a dollar a carton. And I went to the, I tried and said, I've got some cigarettes. He said, I'll need a uh, thousand cartons. I said, I've got 150. He said, how about 500? I said, uh, 120, oh, 175. He said, how about 200? I said, five. So I gave him these cartons. He got scrawny, 50 little scrawny, uh, you know, Spaniards. He gave each of them a carton. He kept the other and became rich immediately. And, uh, but they got that back into the ammunition holes in about an hour and a half. 700 Marines to get it out. But the thing was that I had to feed these Marines, and we didn't have the food. So I had to provide <coughs> uh, food. I had a commissary steward who was Italian, and he dreamed up things like uh, chicken. The, these were the number 10 cans of World War I chicken. These were 10 years old. But they had a ration tank, which is absolutely gigantic. And as a result, I uh, was able to build up huge ration counts, feeding these 700 that I bought. When I came back to the States, into Norfolk, I was able to feed the crew for about a month. Uh, oh, we had pheasant, and we had lobster, and we had all kinds of things, thanks to those 700 Marines. That's the end of the story. Did you have plenty of supplies? Well, in sorta. Of. It depends. Uh, when you're on a battleship, yes. And when you can, you know, you're in in the war zone. Uh, on the, yes, always. Did you feel pressure or stress? Not really. Not really. I was always on either at home or on a ship, which felt pretty good. I mean, I had a little stress when the Marines were there, but uh, nothing, really. Was there something special you did for good luck? No. How did people entertain themselves? Well, on various ships, it depends on where you were. If you were... Uh, uh, on the Washington Front, we had our, of course, had our movies, and uh, uh, we're, we did we're at what they called Condition Two a great deal of the time when you were sitting, uh, waiting for the enemy to strike or what have you. It was always waiting because we really had only one or two, you no know, real active engagements. Uh, you smoked. Uh, for a while until you got so sick because you could not smoke in condition two. So I gave up smoking at the age of 18, which was great. And I've never smoked since. Uh, you know, later on in life, it depends if we were in, uh, on the Kearsarge, we, you know, went to Europe, we visited I spent four years in Spain with my family, so, I mean, I did all kinds of things. What did you do when you were on leave? Uh, it depends where we were, and uh, 
but we did, you know, lots of wonderful things, either overseas or I remember that, uh, for instance, on the Washington, the 1st of January, 1943, we were in Numea, New Caledonia, and uh, we went to a horse race. Uh, we also uh, had Bob Hope on the ship, and, uh, you know, we had all kinds of exciting do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events? You've heard. Do you have any photographs or anything? I bought one stinking photograph. It is the day I retired, the day I was going to Vietnam. If, if you'll hold it up, I can zoom right in on it. There it is. And That's the family. I don't have Admiral Lyle there, but I have another picture which does uh, when he was giving me this oh, that's distinguished wonderful. service, whatever the hell it was. <laughs> that's perfect. That's wonderful. Okay. Thank you. Got it? Yes, sir. Okay. So you recall the, the, the day your service ended. There it is. You've seen it. Yes. Sir. And it was, as I say, quite a momentous day. Instead of going to Vietnam, I got in my car and went to, to uh, Michigan. Did you make any close friendships while in the service? Many. At you, all you, levels. Do you continue any of those relationships? Yes. Right now we are, in fact last night I had dinner with uh, one of my friends from Rota, Spain. That was in 1962. At that time I was a lieutenant commander and these were the folks that worked with me. In October of this year we're going back to Rhoda, three, three uh, couples. Uh, my wife died but I am going with them and uh, we're going to retrace our steps. Did you That's join, one thing. Did you join a veterans organization, sir? Yeah. Uh, not, not a lot of, I mean there's the USS Washington. I'll probably be going to their reunion uh, thing in this year. Uh, I, the FW, yeah, I, I mean, I send money in, and the one of the other militaries I send money to. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? Well, I went back to uh, uh, Michigan, University of Michigan, got my PhD in a thing called medical care organization uh, with incidentally some of the same folks that I'd met at at uh, Harvard. Uh, in fact, uh, Mr. Silver, or Dr. Silver, who had started the Medicare, Medic kind of thing, was at Michigan. He'd also been at Harvard. And uh, so uh, it's a small day of work. And, uh, but I went on and taught for, well, from 1970 to 1999. And uh, I'm still involved with that, with teaching. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes, I, I am, uh, I strongly abhor war and I am quite adverse to what's going on in Iraq now. I think that, well, yeah. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Very profound. They gave me all of my education. It found me my wife. It uh, paid for every, my two kids birth and uh, uh, so very, very profoundly and very wonderful. Is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? I can't think of a thing. Well, I want to thank you personally very much. It's been my pleasure to do this interview. Well, thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. It's, it's, been, it's been my pleasure. I really appreciate this. Thank you, sir. Yeah.